Welcome to the Luke Messiah Show. While we know at this point that we are headed to a special session and we don't know exactly all of the legislation that'll get debated during that session, there's still opportunities to pass a handful of very conservative bills. We're gonna talk about those today. One of them is property tax relief. And the good news is that the Texas House has caved to the Senate, brought homestead exemptions into their plan, now providing a bigger property tax relief plan than either the Senate or the House originally started with. This is a win for taxpayers, and we hope to go even further. There are a lot of bills dying in House committees, and if they don't pass out by Saturday, they're going to die as well. We're going to highlight some of those bills for you today. Let's get to the show. The Texas House of Representatives is set to debate SB3, which has been replaced. It is the Senate property tax plan, which has now been replaced by the House property tax plan, but they have kept the homestead exemptions in. And this is really key. The reason is, is because now you have three components to the House's property tax plan. You have a 5% appraisal cap, which will help a lot of investors, people who don't have a homestead exemption on their home. And if you do have a homestead exemption on your home, it'll still help you because it'll go from a 10% increase cap to a 5% increase cap. Importantly, it does also now incorporate the homestead exemption that what has been the brainchild of Senator uh, Paul Betancourt and Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick. And it also has property tax compression, which is the preferred property tax relief mechanism by Texans for Fiscal Responsibility, the Don Huffines Liberty Foundation, the Texas Public Policy Foundation. All of these groups have said compression is king. And just as a reminder, compression is where the state of Texas writes a check to school districts. But when that money shows up, they are required to lower your property tax bill the same amount as the money that they receive. It compresses the rate. So these three components now add up to a little under $17 billion of property tax relief. The largest property tax cut in Texas history would be closer to 20 billion, but this is higher than the House or the Senate had before, which is really good news for Texans. Another great news piece of news is that Speaker Dade Phelan seems to have uh, appropriately stepped back from using language that he was being criticized from the right for. Representative Tony Tinderholt got up during the property tax relief debate on the House floor last time it was had and basically laid out, we keep telling everybody that we have all of this property tax relief, but we're using relief that we provided two years ago. And the fact that we're still funding it means that it's new relief. No one really sees that as new relief. And then Texans for Fiscal Responsibility actually went into Dade Fields District and bought a lot of radio ads pushing him on the same issue, saying he's misleading his voters. So Dade Phelan's office put out a one-pager on their property tax relief plan. And here is the new talking point. They say that their property tax relief plan that's actually under $17 billion is $21 billion. And they say it is the largest cut in Texas history when combined with the state budget. That's a really interesting lie. Now, I, for one, really appreciate the change in language. He's being honest, at least saying, hey, if you combine this with the state budget, it is the largest property tax cut in Texas history. Now, that is true. So thank you, Speaker Phelan. I also want to make sure you know just how true that statement is almost every single session. So let's say next session, We take the homestead exemption we passed. We take the compression that we funded. We take the appraisal caps that were put together. And we go, well, we don't have a lot of money. So the Texas House is going to deliver $100 of property tax relief. Not 21 billion, not 16 billion. Let's say two years from now, they say, we have $100. And you're gonna see on average a 0.03 cent reduction on your property tax bill. If they roll that out, they could also say, this is the largest property tax cut in Texas history when combined with the state budget. Here's the absurdity of the statement. Guys, as long as you keep budgeting the relief you had before, if you add $1, it's the largest property tax cut in Texas history, right? So it's good that he changed the language and actually finally admitted, yeah, as a standalone, This isn't the largest property tax cut in Texas history. That's appreciated. And the new line, while somewhat comical, is also true. So that's good. 
Guys, we have a bunch of Senate bills languishing in the Texas House of Representatives, some very key conservative policy, things that matter, and I actually think that matter in various different forms and fashions, areas, various different committees that are sitting on this policy. I'm going to break down some of this list so you realize just how bad it is on that side of the chamber when we come back. Do you want to get paid to make a difference? Gen Z is now in Congress, and if you're between the ages of 18 and 25, you may not necessarily want to be in Congress, but if you still want to fight for the future, we have the opportunity for you. Texas Scorecard is Texans' leading news source for citizens, and we're looking for young fighters to join our fellowship program. Texas Scorecard offers a paid internship for spring, summer, and fall semesters, allowing participants to get their feet wet in the media business. Fellows can apply for one of three tracks, writing, research, and administration. Think you have what it takes? Bells often leave the program with the opportunity to continue the work full time. I had my team print off every single Senate bill that is sitting in a House committee. This does not include the Senate bills that are sitting in the Calendars Committee. Now, just to give you a, a perspective on how slow the Texas House is moving, if a bill does not pass out of committee by Saturday, it's dead. And if a Senate bill does not pass the House floor by, I think, next Tuesday, it's dead. So you would think that if you had hundreds of conservative pieces of policy, then you as a chamber would be working pretty quickly to try to efficiently pass as much as humanly possible. In the last week that they were passing House bills out of the chamber, they literally passed hundreds of bills in a day or two. Interestingly enough, there are 198 bills just in this report. These are bills that are sitting in House committees that are Senate bills that they, they could get voted out at any time. They go to the calendars committee, get placed on a calendar and pass, go to the governor's desk. So if they're not moving, it's an intentional killing of that legislation on the part of the chairman. Okay, so let's talk about what kind of policy is dying. The last thing I'm going to say, though, is that today on the House floor, as I'm recording this, they're debating the women's sports bill. And that'll take an hour, maybe two. And then after that, they will debate 15 Senate bills. Yesterday, it was 33 Senate bills. They are intentionally basically phoning in like half days. By 4 or 5 p.m. some of these days, they're off the floor. There is no intention of trying to get as much as they can get done as much as they possibly can in this final uh, week of the legislative session. So not only are committee chairmen sitting on these bills, the calendars committee is also working very slowly with even the bills they have been given. SB 177 is the COVID vaccine mandate ban. There can be no COVID vaccine mandates, okay? This bill was passed out of public health, both the House version and the Senate version. I mean, the House version passed out well over a month ago. The Senate bill passed out after Tony Tinderholt put a lot of pressure on Stephanie Click to get it out. And they're just sitting on the bill, just sitting in calendars, not moving. It could be on any of these calendars. We could debate it, pass it out of the chamber, and it could go to the governor's desk. It passed out a committee with bipartisan support, all the Republicans and some Democrats. It's not, it's probably going to have over 90 yes votes on the bill, but it's not on the calendar. Okay. They're intentionally not trying to get done as much as they can because, again, it all needs to bottleneck at the end. So remember when they were voting for all those five-day weekends? Yeah. They voted to go home for five days, four days, three days. And they kept saying, well, we're going to get really busy at the end. And now it's the end. And they're not getting really busy. So let's highlight a couple of these bills. One of them is the Senate resolution that was passed that would declare an invasion at the southern border. It's very simple. This is the legislative declaration that we are under an invasion. And this would hopefully spur on the governor to take even additional actions. And it would inform him that he can repel. He can take illegals that are coming into this country, several million of them, and send them back into Mexico. It's a great border policy. And it's just sitting in the State Affairs Committee. We also have Senate Bill 6. This is a big power proposal, energy proposal by the lieutenant governor that he has pushed out to try to prevent rolling blackouts in Texas. Also, the whole problem, and this is going to get to another bill, in fact, that Lois Goldhorst has, is that there is uh, an overdependence of green energy in the state of Texas. I, I just 
we've talked about this a little bit on the program, but I'm just going to reiterate the reality that the Green New Deal is expanding in the state of Texas, and it is making our grid less reliable. It is making you have less certainty that when you flip on the switch, the lights are going to come on. And the problem is that it's getting less reliable by the day. Senator Hughes passed a bill that says no critical race theory at our higher education institutions. If you're Texas A&M and UT, which by the way, we've done a lot of writing about this at Texas Scorecard. Chris Rufo has done exposés on this. There's massive amounts of racism at our colleges. The Senate passed a bill that said, hey, we should get rid of the racism at our colleges. The Texas House has killed that bill, pure and simple. Now, what they have done is they've moved the DEI bill which is going to come up for a debate probably sooner rather than later, SB 17. But what they did with it is that they took a bill that said no DEI offices. So Texas A&M has like 300 diversity full-time employees that do nothing but make sure that the university is racist. Here's what the House did. They said, well, instead of banning it, we're going to say that no public money can get used for it. Unless you cannot have any officers. It even says we're banning them, except if a grant requires they be hired. Oh, and ex- and un- except in the event that an individual privately pays you to have racist employees whose job it is to make sure that your university is more racist. Imagine that. So just to let you know, there are a lot of liberal wealthy people who have no problem writing a big tax deducted check to a university just to make sure that they keep those 300 Marxist employees. So SB 17 has been watered down and moved. SB 16, it's just sitting in committee. Critical race theory banning universities, not even getting talked about. You have a lot of bills in state affairs, elections, and public health. Those are kind of the three that stick out to me the most. Now there's higher education and other things like that. But I will tell you that those three in particular have a lot of bills that are dying. Representative uh, Senator Drew Springer has Senate Bill 150. This is a bill related to the maximum amount of unemployment benefits payable to an individual. This is basically welfare reform, positive welfare reform, just sitting in business and industry. Now, if you think, well, why is this welfare reform just sitting in business and industry? Maybe because there's a Democrat chairman. Okay, maybe that's it. Um, Lois Kolkhorst has Senate Bill 147. And Senate Bill 147 is just saying that, hey, Chinese nationals, They cannot purchase our agriculture land, our minerals, our water, our timber, anything we mine, sitting in state affairs, not moving, not been voted out. Even if it was voted out, it wouldn't necessarily be on the floor in debate because the calendars committee might kill it. But you know what? That's fine. Charles Perry has a number of very good bills. The one that is most offensive, uh, the one that I'm most offended that it's sitting in committee is Senate Bill 162. This is Charles Perry's bill that says that a child when they're born is born either a girl or a boy, a male or a female. Their sex is on their birth certificate. And it says you can't change it because right now all these leftists can take their kid in and can file a bunch of paperwork and they can change their birth certificate so that they can then go into the public school and say, hey, Tommy is a boy. And no, Tommy's not Tommy, and he's not a boy. Tommy's name is Sarah, and Sarah was born a girl, and she is a girl, and no matter what you say, you can't change that. Now understand, the Texas House just said we were so courageous by banning genital mutilation. Yes, thank you for doing that. Not that courageous, by the way. A bunch of Democrats voted with you. I mean, several Democrats voted with you. So it's not that courageous when every Republican and several Democrats vote for it. This is something that 80% of Texans want to see happen. You're not taking massive political risks. You're doing something that's obvious. You know what you're also obviously doing, Stephanie Click and Public Health Committee? You're killing Senate Bill 162, which says that you can't change your kid's birth certificate. Very simple. Why is it sitting there? It got referred to public health on April 10th. On April 11th, it could, have be, it could have been scheduled for a hearing. Donna Campbell has a bill regarding the national motto, founding documents, just stuff that's getting a little less wokeness in our public education system and a little more patriotism. Mays Middleton has Senate Bill 175, sitting in state affairs, referred there on April 13th, banning taxpayer-funded lobbying in the state of Texas, saying, hey, all of us don't, we cannot, our money cannot be used to hire a bunch of lobbyists who are they going to work against our own interests. 
sitting in state affairs, not moving whatsoever. There are a ton of election laws, and I could go through them just to give you a handful of them. It's like Senate Bill 260, Senate Bill 220. Uh, you go through, I'm just looking through these various different bills that are all in elections. If you literally pull up the elections committee, and I did it earlier, Bob Hall has a number of bills. Paul Betancourt has a number of bills. Lois Kolkhorst has a number of bills. Just sitting there in committee. There's like five or six. The elections committee can meet at any time, hear these bills, vote them out, send them to calendars, put them on the calendar. There was one bill that got put on the calendar regarding the state of Texas getting out of the ERIC system, which the state of Alabama did. And we've talked about that a little bit here at Texas Scorecard. And it was killed with a point of order. Democrats killed it. They pushed it back. So these are the problems that are coming out. It's they're, they're looking at nine good election integrity bills, maybe passing one or two out of the committee, just sitting on the rest, no reason, no articulated reason, just doing it. There are quite a few health freedom bills that are also at stake. One of them is a good example. Charles Perry has Senate Bill 265. This is related to the required reports of certain vaccine-related, drug-related adverse reactions. This would be the state of Texas actually getting reported information when someone is injured by a vaccine. Bob Hall has Senate Bill 301. That's just sitting in public health. Related to prescribing, administering, and dispensing ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, sulfate. This is Bob Hall trying to protect all of these good patriotic doctors who actually took their oath really seriously to do no harm and spent all that time trying to figure out what would work with their COVID patients because the things that they were being told to do weren't working. And now those same doctors have been persecuted for doing so by the Texas Medical Board. And Bob Hall tries to pass a bill that just says, hey, these doctors are going to be given the latitude and discretion. There's that bill. Another one that he had, um, there's Senator Springer relating to a study on the adverse reactions efficacy of the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, the other one here is by Angela Paxson relating to patient access to prescription drugs for off-label use for COVID-19 treatment. Again, saying, hey, these are all common sense pieces of legislation. Like these are not massively complex bills. They're not genital mutilation bans. They're just saying, hey, you should be able to use drugs even if they're not specifically for the purpose of COVID-19 for COVID-19 because COVID-19 is a new disease. These are the type of policies that are being considered, were considered in the Senate, were passed out of the Senate, and they're just sitting there dying in the Texas House of Representatives. It's very strange to see. It's disheartening. It's frustrating. Campbell has, uh, Donna Campbell has a bill, Senate Bill 959, related to certain prohibited transactions between an open enrollment charter school and an abortion provider. Does that sound like a pretty good bill to you? Doesn't it sound like, hey, if you're uh, maybe trying to make sure that Planned Parenthood isn't in our charter schools, probably a good bill. Simple thing to pass. Consider in the public state affairs committee, it was sent to state affairs, bring it up, talk about it, vote it out, put it on the calendar, debate it. If there's enough votes, pass it. Make sure Planned Parenthood is not in our charter schools. Guys, the list goes on and on. I've literally scratched the surface of hundreds of bills, hundreds of policies that are sitting there languishing in the Texas House of Representatives. And I'm not the expert on every single one of these bills. I don't know every single one of them, but I can tell you this. The Texas House isn't even debating them. It's not that they've had the hearings, they've heard these bills, realized, oh my gosh, this bill actually does a bunch of bad stuff. They're just sitting on it. In many cases, they've never done anything. For over a month, it's just been sitting there. An obvious bill that could obviously be good for Texans. As we wrap up the legislative session, there's going to be an opportunity to pass a couple key bills. And the one that seems to definitely be moving is, thanks to Texas Family Project, the ban on drag shows. And this is a huge opportunity for a victory for the pro-family forces who have said, we don't want our kids groomed. And so this bill has moved out of the State Affairs Committee. It is going to the Calendars Committee. And the Calendars Committee could place it on the calendar very soon. And I have heard that the Calendars Committee is urging that bill to move because Dade Phelan is very, very sensitive about this. Since the Texas Family Project went up in his district and started running these ads as the bill was dying, they literally, I mean, he sent two different legal letters to try to get this ad pulled while clearly telling his lieutenants, like, get this bill going. 
And one of the things this has proved out is one, that conservatives should always push and apply pressure. Stop backing down. These guys don't respond to being nice. When you're nice, they kill hundreds of bills. When you call them out specifically for certain things that are obviously good, they cave to the pressure. And this bill is moving. And if it does pass, that'll be a huge victory for pro-family forces. If it fails, it will be an indictment on the Texas House of Representatives for sitting on it for four and a half months before waking up to the fact that they actually needed to do something about this policy. Those are a few of the things going on right now. I mentioned at the start of the show that we are going to a special session. We are going to. It could be in June. It could be in September. I think Governor Abbott has kind of several different things in consideration. The advantage to bringing the legislature back immediately is that you literally don't let them get a break. You say, hey, you're not going home. You don't get to see your kids this week. You don't get to do this. Be back and get to work. You put the pressure on them. The disadvantage is that every liberal Beto O'Rourke donating teacher union member is going to be in the Capitol all summer because we pay them to not work during the summer. And so it is very difficult to then come and say school choice is going to get debated through the summer when the Capitol is going to be filled with liberal socialist teacher union members who are trying to turn our kids into little Marxists. So there has been some mention that the governor may wait till September to call the special session back. Now, the other thing is, just a reminder for those of you who don't know how this works, the governor can put any item on a special session call. So when he calls a special session, he can say, we're here to talk about school choice. But is the whole legislature gonna come and just do nothing but talk about this one policy issue? So he could easily say, oh, and by the way, we're going to try to ban uh, ban Chinese nationalists from purchasing Texas land. And while we're at it, we're going to make sure Planned Parenthood isn't in our charter schools. And while we're at it, we're going to try to pass these n- numerous amounts of election integrity bills. And while we're at it, and he could go down the list, item by item by item by item. So there will be a lot of conservatives who are asking the governor to address these serious issues that have been killed in the Texas House of Representatives. We hope that he rolls out a long list. And that also puts more pressure on the legislature to say, hey, I'll keep you coming back and I'll keep adding more and more contentious things onto that list until you deliver what I've asked you to deliver, which is a meaningful school choice program. I hope that this gives you a little bit of an update on all the things that are happening in the Texas Capitol, the legislation that is potentially gonna pass and some of the legislation that looks like it's gonna die. Every little bit of help that you apply, pressure you apply to these lawmakers makes a difference. I can tell you, I know conservative organizations who have literally gone into offices in the last week to talk about one good immigration bill, one good health freedom bill, one good other bill. And all these are on the five and 10 yard line, just need to get punched over the finish line. And they're literally hearing from these offices, look, we support the bill. We want to move the bill. We've been asking to move the bill. We've been getting a lot of calls on this bill, right? So those of you who think that just reaching out for stuff you care about and talking to your representative doesn't make an impact, like it literally does. It makes an impact. It prods the right people that know we need to do this because we don't want our constituents to be angry when we leave all of these conservative reforms on the table undone. Have a blessed weekend. May God bless you. And may God bless the great state of Texas. No ads, no paywalls, no government grants, and no corporate masters. Just real news for real Texans. This is Texas Scorecard. 